صباح الخير اسمحوا لنا نبدا معكم الجلسه الثانيه اليوم جود مورنينج وي ويل ريزيوم ذا اكتيفيتيز اوف ذس ورك شوب اند ناو وي ار وذ سكند سيشن وي ثانك ذا سنتر فيري ماتش فور really focusing attention on this uh, very important issue. Session two is entitled Forced Migration and Demographic Change in Syria. We will have three speakers. The first by Saja Azzobi uh, with uh, Mr. Humam Warde entitled uh, internally displaced persons between the curse of war and the uh, labeliness of displacement. Second paper by Mr. Samer Bakur, Dimensions of Sectarian Displacement in Idlib. The third by Dr. Hamza Al-Mustafa, Syria, the Refugee Crisis and Internal Demographic Change. The three speakers are Syrians and they have uh, practical field experience and they have met with displaced people inside Syria. Their papers are based on tangible and uh, field work and field work. We know the revolution in Syria started in 2011 and uh, the situation in Syria became really difficult for almost everyone. The aspirations of people were met with the oppression of uh, the government and also the role played by the internal forces and external forces led to more uh, strife and more conflict. Eight years into this conflict, uh, which caused the biggest uh, humanitarian disaster after World War II, according to many experts, uh, opinions and hundreds and thousands of people were either killed or millions were displaced and uh, 5.6 million people were either displaced or they went abroad seeking refuge in neighboring countries and other host countries. The latest estimates of the number of internally displaced persons in August uh, 2019 says 6.14 million internally displaced people. This is probably the number one uh, estimate of people. And it, only in 2019, uh, one, more, uh, more than 1.1 million people have become displaced. Despite the fact that uh, the fighting waned a little bit, but the number of displaced people has not been positively impacted, and the people, these people cannot return home for reasons to do with internal politics and outside influence. We are trying to to continue now, in the morning session, Dr. Haider also said that uh, th uh, the first or second wave of the Iraqis in 2007 onwards went to Syria and because they had the economic means to do so. We will talk about the needs of people who are displaced, the three speakers, we will try to manage time to the best of our ability. We start with Dr. <coughs> Saja. Thank you, Dr. Ali, and uh, good morning to you all. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Saja Az-Zaubi. 
I had to leave Syria in 2016. I work at the Oxford Department of International Development, University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. It's my pleasure to be with you today, uh, presenting before such distinguished gathering. So, uh, therefore, the internally displaced people of uh, Syria between the curse of war and the labeling of displacement. Dr. Ali mentioned the beginnings of this problem, so I will not uh, delve into more details. In the first quarter of 2013, only according to development indicators, I the in Syria, uh, the, the each year Syria has experienced even worse uh, situations so far as development is concerned, and this uh, has meant uh, a lack of development at the education, health, industrial and many other levels, but because uh, I focus on development and gender issues, the biggest loss one, the human capital, according to UN statistics, 13 million, million people in Syria are in need of uh, uh, help and aid, and more than 6 million are internally displaced, and more than 6 million are refugees abroad. And the largest concentration of refugees is in Syria, over 3 million. Uh, but uh, Lebanon saw also a large concentration of Syrian refugees. Uh, the f f one refugee per five citizens of Lebanon. Jordan also, for per every 15 Jordanian citizens, there was one Syrian refugee. The other aspect which is important to be mentioned is education. The biggest loss in the education sector, whether in the destruction of the infrastructure and the educational system, or in the children uh, 4 to 14 age group who have lost their opportunity to get educated for many reasons. The paper the paper tries to describe the waves of uh, displacement within Syria and the uh, uh, demographic impact of that and the economic and social challenges faced by the internally displaced persons and what can be made to support them and consolidate uh, their ability to sustain their situation. The field work took place in the Salamiya in the uh, middle ground of Syria in near Hama and the Suwaida on the south, southern parts of Syria because they are considered as relatively safe areas. And uh, also so far as the services provided to internally uh, displaced people. The methodology relies on the quantitative and qualitative analysis of a field study in 2015 to 2016. Uh, five uh, groups of discussion groups were organized, personal interviews also, a questionnaire on a random sample of 193 of uh, uh, households and also a meeting with the, the municipality workers in the areas which uh, received these displaced people. Uh, 
so far as the, demog the demographic uh, impact is concerned in the two areas of the study through the interviews and the focus groups with uh, displaced people or refugees uh, three uh, waves were identified first was uh, the individual one which uh, formed 7.7 percent of the sample started from 2011 until July 2012. This was uh, at the individual level and uh, families uh, started leaving their areas due to political sectarian conflict and uh, and it, it, it also marked the beginning of uh, the stoppages in the schooling system. The second wave, which was like the max exodus by uh, large numbers of people together, which formed 59.1%, started from 2012 uh, uh, to the middle of 2013 and uh, this was known as uh, the phase of the Damascus volcano phase uh, and, uh, and also most of these people uh, was marked by the Raqqa province entering into the fray and the uh, armed conflict and uh, acts of looting and etc. armed robbery was committed. Number three was the phase where terrorists and extremists uh, took control from the middle of 2013 to the end of 2015. And this was marked by the increased influence of Al-Qaeda and Jabhat and Nusra on the one hand, and ISIS on the other, and the conflict between them over the control of their areas and the destruction that has resulted. And this uh, phase marked an end of uh, uh, the education system and schools being able to provide education. Number four was the phase of the large uh, wars and 14.5% uh, and this uh, started 2016 until now which were marked by the fighting between the regime on the one hand and the armed factions against it uh, on the other and the displacement of the eastern Ghouta areas and others took place in this period. Uh, Number two, we will be talking about uh, the areas which uh, the displaced people originated from and they were areas where the conflict started. They started with calling for their legitimate uh, rights and needs and later on the conflict became an international war or civil war and uh, these waves meant that the components of the Syrian society different factions started uh, mixing with others this, the, the people who were part of this displacement movement meant that uh, they chose areas they wanted to go to, they were not forced to, and they were received rather well. And uh, also the demographic uh, change also started taking place because, for example, Sueda, uh, where by and large the people belong to the Druze faction and uh, and also 80% uh, of the displaced people are also 
from the Druze faction, but they came from other areas. No, I made a mistake. More than 80% were Sunnis, in fact, from Dar'a and not uh, Druze, and from the from uh, from uh, uh, <coughs> rural uh, suburbs of uh, Damascus. The percentages of uh, displaced people in the Salamia, which is uh, largely Ismaili by affiliation, and the members of this sect from other provinces and some Sunnis from Salamia, whereas 41.9% of the displaced were Sunni. In fact, 10% were Alawites who were made to leave their areas. And the Salamiya area at the beginning of the conflict received a lot of people from Hama, but uh, the situation in Hama became, uh, it has changed quickly with uh, uh, security, the security situation improving and people went back also. As for the family structure of these uh, displaced people, what can be considered even positive a little to a certain extent out of this phenomena that uh, the members of each family have uh, had to uh, go their separate ways and end up living in different parts. And uh, many people, in fact, who are elderly, who did not want to leave their own areas, or they insisted on remaining where they were. In comparison, some families with male members in a certain age group decided to to leave their areas but they left they they left their young males behind generally speaking more than one third of the families were the type who left at least one person behind in their uh, home towns or places 20% of the families started now uh, being uh, now supported financially by women and female members, either because the male members were left behind or they were killed or injured or kidnapped or whatever. This has meant an extra burden on women and a bigger responsibility sometimes more than what they could bear, in fact. Uh, especially that uh, women from rural communities were not prepared to deal with such a responsibility. The economic and social uh, challenges, f first of all, the financial situation and the relationship between that and the poverty line, most of the displaced families in Syria were very fragile financially. If we consider the poverty line as $1.9 per in capita per day, we will find that 90% of the families which were the subject of the study were poor, and 20% of them were uh, uh, headed by women who are trying to earn a living for the family. So therefore, the majority of the sample studied meant that more than one third of the sample are uh, in, were in need of help. As for the sources of income, most of these families lost their properties or other means of providing a living, and this led them to be even more fragile. 
and the destruction of the economic means of the family to sustain itself. Also, the change in the gender roles, 90% of these families now became uh, uh, supported by women, and women earned the living for them and became the breadwinners. And this has forced many women to seek employment, although in most cases they lacked uh, the qualification or the experience, especially those from the rural communities. Even before the war, some women used to work in the field of agriculture or industry, but they were not able to enter a marketplace and deal with men because this was uh, a field of economic activity exclusive to men. This, of course, uh, led to an imbalance uh, and also the income of these families uh, have been negatively impacted. Also, there were another problem was in accommodation uh, accommodation costs went really up in Syria, and under these circumstances, it was difficult to find accommodation. Even the 50% of them found relatively good uh, houses to live in, to rent. But there was a lot of them also, with the entire family having to live in one room or some were in houses which were not complete, they were still under construction. As for the psychological aspect, there were four indicators uh, indi used uh, to, to gauge the happiness, uh, optimism, etc., and how to deal with problems and solve these problems. These indicators show that uh, most of the people surveyed were in a bad psychological uh, situation, and especially the ones who were uh, uh, financed by women and men. The ones who were financed by women were e in an even worse situation. Of course, this has impacted social relations. To Two minutes. Okay, uh, I'll focus on education. Now the social relations has impacted people, have impacted people, and as we said, many children had to drop schooling, and some of them led to some children having behavioral problems, uh, and education is probably the priority issue which should be taken into account in the reconstruction phase, especially children with 14 to 16 age group, 6 to 14, 19% of them are completely dropped out of schools. Also, there is 36 percent uh, uh, stopped attending schools because their families could not provide the means for them to attend schools or the lack of schools. Now, based on the discussion, focus groups and interviews, etc., and the personal interviews, we analyzed the situation to, in the hope of reaching some solutions. 25% of the sample were found to have uh, loans from developmental agencies, and this led to 24% uh, of them improving their economic situation. This is a very good indication to raise their living standards. 
الأجر على رصد الحاجات والمصادر لها. As for the needs for this group, we found that most of the sample members the possibility of staying where they are or returning to their homes have become almost equal for many reasons. Our survey indicated that there are some elements if provided can possibly result in deciding whether these people would remain where they are or return to their homes. And our survey found that they needed uh, working opportunities, job opportunities, especially for women, and to have uh, small businesses or start small businesses, especially for women, and most importantly to uh, have uh, schools for their children and security for them in life. And also, uh, after the security question, of course, which is a big priority, in order for them to return, they said that they need security to prevail again, and also to, if their property is still remained intact, to restore their ownership and uh, also, also their return should be from their current situation to a situation which is good or better, not just as bad as where they are now. And also, the, for me, in my conclusion, I say that uh, we can benefit from this uh, study is the necessity to invest in the human capital through education, especially for children in the age group of 6 to 14. Also provide training for the young and women and also uh, micro loans should be provided, especially for women, which is in a way uh, suited to their uh, needs and uh, conditions. As for the political level, it must be said that coexistence uh, and integration between different sects show that the war in itself is not sectarian, but sectarian tools are used to wage it and uh, Political factions are totally ignoring the needs of the general population. Thank you. The floor to Dr. Sami Bakur to present us with a unique experience in Syria. It's a rare case that we should uh, discuss, the Idlib case. Peace be upon you. First, I would like to thank the Arab Center for allowing us to raise this very sensitive issue for us. I would also like to thank the Arab Center for uh, generously welcoming us and following up on our stuff till we got to Qatar. The Idlib issue is very sensitive, especially that I'm a son of the Idlib province. I also were, uh, conducted field interviews with people present in Idlib, my parents, my family, are in Idlib. So it was a, a quality field experience. You know the movement of displacement from other provinces to Idlib. Idlib has become now the small Syria. 
because every person from another province is present uh, in Idlib. Of course, we uh, hope uh, Syria returns uh, as a uh, country. So we will look into the dimensions of sectarian displacement in Idlib. Uh, Idlib represents a, a perfect framework and environment for all the Islamic factions, jihadis, and armed uh, factions present in Idlib. Idlib used to have a, a perfect so social fabric. Unfortunately, after the displacement there too, and I'm going to speak about the internal displacement within Idlib and not the displacement from other provinces towards Idlib. So this social fabric and the perfect formation or structure of Idlib before 2011 is no longer. Yes, so no longer exists. Dr. Azmi Bishara, and I quote, noted in one of his studies on sectarianism that a state uh, should be liberated from the power of the state. Religion should be uh, liberated from the power of the state. Now, when we speak about it, it should be freed from political sectarianism, especially after the control of the Islamic opposition radical uh, Islamic opposition uh, controlled it. Because unfortunately, those that use the state against citizenship, against citizens, I'm talking about uh, the party system before 2011 and the Islamic factions that ruled it from 2011 to 2015, they used the state against citizens. But at the same time, after 2015, they used religion against citizens. I'm talking about the Al-Sham Liberation Committee, as it's called today. And this under, within this understanding of sectarianism, considering it as a result of uh, conflicts and uh, interactions amongst the different factions and powers, I can explain and say that the conflict in Idlib was never a Sunni Shia or uh, only a Sunni Shia conflict. After the control of the Islamic factions, it became a conflict between a ruling elite and the marginalized rural communities. The conflicts and alliances amongst different powers also fueled the sectarian division. It also grew because of the political use of religion in Idlib and the entry by clergymen into the daily politics. This paper tries hard to show the political outcomes and the social outcomes that were produced by some jihadi movements and that eventually led to internal displacement within the province. As well as identifying its activities, its roles, and the roles of the Islamic uh, uh, parties, uh, be it ethnic or religious, and also identifying the role of the regional and international powers in using this phenomenon of displacement as their ideology. This paper will also examine the ideological impact of the Islamic factions and the change of their political tools by turning from soft power to hard power. Now, if I'm to speak about the political sectarianism, I have to speak about uh, political sectarianism in Idlib before and after the regime. And then how the Al-Sham Liberation Committee controlled it after 2015. Now I will speak about the effect of political sectarianism in Idlib and the Syrian revolution after uh, the regime controlled the security in Damascus and re-liberated and the re-liberation of Aleppo, the economic capital. This uh, tragic war only found in Idlib its, its uh, fertile ground. We know that at the, in early 2018, the regime started a brutal uh, campaign against Idlib. 
pretending to want to, to re-liberate some villages. It continued in 2018. This is the subject of my research. The sectarian political manipulation of Idlib as per the regime uh, uh, policy that focused on uh, identity as a regional uh, or general framework uh, of their policy, focusing on religion, uh, the religious sector affiliation, and ethnicity. al baad had combined both Arabism and Islam. It adopted or it relied greatly on the Mashaykh, the sheikhs, the clergymen, the religious figures that uh, were in the forefront of the regime forces. The emergence of sectarianism in Idlib is a new creation. There's a part of the country that had the social uh, diversity. But this uh, conflict b amongst the different factions that caused displacement inside of Idlib restructured uh, the fabric in Idlib uh, on a basis of marginalization and exclusion. Bashar al-Assad had tried to adapt to the emergence of extremism and radicalism through the policy of polarization adopted by his late father vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, Bashar al-Assad continued that with this policy by supporting the Sunni majority. Specifically, uh, uh, one group, the Sufis. I'll speak about that later. Political sectarianism, is it important to, when we look into displacement in Idlib? Yes, because it uh, relies on the society that is built on the ideology of the Islamic uh, groups controlling, controlling the region. Idlib was faced with a lot of conflicts amongst the political factions, each of which were trying to create a sectarian entity with geographical borders and frontiers uh, dictated by an ideology. And to enter into the heart of this ideology, you have to be a permanent member thereof. In Idlib, the Islamic uh, currents and movements give different meanings to citizenship. Islamic factions worked on attracting Islamic youth and, and uh, targeting the marginalized and the poor in the city. The identity in Idlib, be it uh, national, religious, or state-wise or country-wise, uh, became like a target for uh, armed Islamic factions. Now I will speak about uh, the displacement of minorities. When I speak of minorities, I speak of ethnic minorities and religious minorities. I will start with the Christian families that were present in Idlib. Idlib comprised a large number of Christian families who had all their rights. Unfortunately, the militarization, the Salafi rhetoric of uh, armed Islamic factions forced those minorities to choose one amongst two, either stay silent or be displaced. After the fall of Idlib in the hands of different armed factions, Idlib was a victim of a structured campaign of looting and stealing of the properties of those Christian families. Uh, and if I don't want to uh, be this hard, I can say that many of the properties were looted, not all of them. This gave the impression to Christians that Idlib will never be secure for them. Those Christians asked the different patriarchs and churches available in Latakia and Tartus to allow them to uh, move there internal displacement within the provinces or within the province of Idlib going to pockets that are not controlled by uh, the Sham Liberation Committee or Nusra. This was the first uh, movement or wave of displacement of Christian families to avoid being harassed in Idlib. Some Christian families in Idlib stayed 
hoping for an improvement in the future, but the improvement didn't come because the Al Sham Liberation Committee conducted a campaign of intensive measures against the Christians. Those measures included confiscating their properties, canceling and annulling the guarantees that uh, the committee had given them. It means a forced displacement within the province. I will not be able to guarantee your presence in Idlib again. So the Christians had only one choice here to be displaced to the territories of the regime and of the neighboring countries such as Turkey. The second wave of Christian displacement is when the Salute government part of Al-Sham Liberation Committee issued a very uh, risky resolution, said that what remains of the property of Christian families or the Christians that are in Idlib are properties of war. Al-Sham Liberation a Committee gave itself an excuse to become the official tutor or the trustee of the Christian properties. This is when the second uh, wave of Christian displacement happened. And what happened in Jasr al-Shughur during uh, the Junt Harras al-Din and Turkestani party killed a lot of families. The incident that happened <coughs> later was a proof that Al-Sham Liberation Committee, as the ruling committee, was saying that Christians no longer have a place in this province. What is sure was that this was used by Al-Assad regime. Alexander Ivanov the official spokesperson said that we bombard uh, Idlib, especially just Shugur, because the Christians there are no longer secure and safe. And the Junt Horas al-Din and the Turkestani party had established a siege or a blockade on the Christian city in Hama. This is a brief of the Christian minority displacement in Idlib. The question is, are there still Christians in Idlib? Even if they still exist, it's, they, they're very few. Because those pockets controlled by other committees had ended in Idlib after the uh, Al-Sham Liberation Committee fully controlled the province in 2019. A second issue has to do with the Druze. The situation uh, differed from the Christians in Idlib. The Druze in Idlib had taken Jabal al Samak as their headquarters. From 2011, they stood by the revolution. They were also hosting the opposition figures, the Syrian uh, Free Army in 2011 and 12 didn't uh, seek to move this battle to Qalbluzi or Jabal al-Sumak because these regions were comprising or hosting displaced from the Free Syrian Army that were displaced from other areas. So the position of the Free Syrian Army towards the Druze minority was very tolerant. But this uh, changed with ISIS uh, control early 2013 as control of the Jabal al-Summa. Unfortunately, at the beginning, the emirs or the princess of the of ISIS, uh, because the Druze did not join the regime, uh, were dealt with in a tolerant way, but it only happened for four to five months. And then something very risky was asked of them, and w which has uh, fueled the first wave of displacement of the Druze. They asked them to turn their uh, mosques uh, into official uh, uh, Muslim mosques. 
They ask them to adopt uh, Islamic practices, uh, uh, pray uh, in the Muslim way, and as well as they ask them to attend uh, a fiqh or jur jurisprudence and religious uh, councils. I had uh, friends in the, in the Sharia faculty who feared uh, this topic specifically, the jurisprudence, because it was too difficult. So how would you ask the Druze to attend that? The second wave of Druze displacement in Suway, that started with those weird requests. We know that the Druze don't accept to marry other than Druze. Uh, so they wanted to marry them. ISIS didn't stay long for that, uh, for in that region. Then the Islamic Front started controlling, and this only lasted for four months. And then something uh, essential happened. The Turkestani party uh, was able to control the Jabal al -Suma. The Igor control with the Turkestani uh, party was a control, was a landmark control. They considered that this area is their protected area, and the Druze had to leave to other pockets, including Yusaltin, Kafar Tachanin, which is well known. This is the second wave of uh, Druze displacement. The third event, the third wave of Druze displacement was with the decision by a Trump Liberation Committee to confiscate some property. One more minute. I want to speak about the Shia, but very briefly, unfortunately. I ran out of time. I come from Idlib, so I deserve that. So for the Shia displacement, the Iran influence in Idlib was very high through the combatants and foreign mercenaries, as well as the dissemination of new weapons. Uh, Idlib became a stronghold for um, Shia militias, minorities, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, IRG. with the Syrian Hezbollah and Fu'a. All this led to an agreement for the transfer of Shia. In 2018, the transfer of Shia happened, but I can say, based on personal interviews I conducted, that the main event for the Shia displacement was uh, through Kafraya and Al Fu'a. The incident of uh, the control by the Lebanese Hezbollah to Zabad of Zabadani and its entrance into Qusayr, it was a provocation to, uh, and it uh, instigated uh, or it caused the Salafi movement. I spoke about the transfer and the move of the Sufis and their continuous displacement in Idlib. I also spoke about the mission of the Free Syrian Army and how its mission was or came to an end. The Sham Liberation Committee, which is the main issue here, which is the main, region, uh, the main reason behind the displacement in Idlib, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, hosted these refugees. There's also a Russian and American uh, role in using the demographic issue to cause more displacement in Idlib. Idlib is a small version of Syria where there's no other place to go. We hope that Idlib 
doesn't uh, start uh, or doesn't witness a horrible war. We hope that uh, negotiations start for the return of uh, uh, refugees from abroad or uh, for the displaced to return as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Dr. Ali mentioned the numbers. I'd like to speak about 6.7 million uh, refugees, 6.1 internally displaced, million uh, displaced. During the first half of 2019, it was around 800,000 displaced after the Turkish operation. We now have 200,000, and the displacement or internal displacement continues. If you look at uh, these figures, along with the figures that are not officially registered for the Syrian refugees, if we calculate the number of expats before the war, 3 million Syrians, we see that they've reached around uh, now 15 million compared with 24 million for the population in Syria before the war. We see clearly this uh, demographic imbalance uh, that happened. This is why I use the term a, a people of refugees. This is not an exaggerated uh, description of the crisis. This was uh, used for the first time in Burhan Ghalioun's uh, book in 1976. He spoke about external occupation and a, an occupation by an internal elite. According to Burhan Ghalioun's definition of the internal uh, occupation is that it had caused uh, a, a whole people of refugees, but without the tents, without the camps. Every Arab sat citizen within their own country is, a, is at the risk of becoming a refugee, even in your own country. This is why we hear a lot of people speaking about uh, the revolution, uh, about the, uh, the rule in Arab countries causing everyone to become refugees. Dr. Azmi Bishara said that the regime uh, dealt with their people from the perspective of an occupation regime. And here we lost uh, the difference between displacement and refugeeship. After uh, putting an end to the policy of open doors, there was an increased displace, displacement. But all the Syrian displaced uh, people are all refugees. My paper is attempting to present a framework that is different than the one that is currently uh, predominant to study migration by focusing on responsiveness, uh, how the refugees uh, contribute negatively or positively to the economy, as done by NGOs, were then attempt to identify or to regulate the sectarian explanation of the whole phenomenon, and which is something that is very trendy when we speak about uh, migration. Some look at it from a religious perspective, others from a political, and others from an economic and financial perspective. We shouldn't uh, overlook the context. My paper documents the Syrian revolution in a timeline while speaking about the characteristics of every phase. A simple figure. Until early 2014, the number of Syrian refugees registered in Europe were 50 and it uh, dropped down to 800,000 by the end of the year. How will you explain this huge or this sharp increase? Without documenting it and linking it to a specific timeline and understanding it as part of its context, all the contributions may be shortcoming. 
انا قسمتها قسمتهم لمراحل المرحله الاولى هي اللي جو دون خياسه I divided them into phases. The first one, a refugee ship without tents, after the oppression by the regime, especially the operations in Dar'a. I spoke about refugee ship as a preemptive or preventive way. The regime hadn't been able to control all the rural areas, and there was a space for uh, displacement to stay away from military operations. During this phase, 2011, there was this, uh, the emergence of the phenomenon of a border city like Antakya and others, and the responsiveness was through tribes. There was great aspect of solidarity and support of Syrian refugees. And this prevented the emergence of camps. I visited Ramsa in, Al in 2000. There were areas of uh, for the refugee, but with the increasing number of refugees, the phase changed and new camps were established. The first wave of uh, refugees happened after the Jusr al-Shughur incident which uh, was when the militarization phase was announced in Syria. There uh, there was a massacre of 40 people, and the military security branch was attacked, with, uh, which caused a counter-massacre. This massacre launched an operation that was called the mother of all battles, as, uh, as the regime put it. And uh, uh, many officers left the army. So if you look at the Jusr al-Shubur incident, and you remember what happened in the 80s with the Muslim Brotherhood, you see that there was a big emptying of the city, 10,000 refugees, and then they were sent to Turkey. So they feared the repetition of the 80s and the Hama example. And here, the new wave of refugees started. Most of them, uh, most refugees of the Jusr al-Shubur were uh, returned. With the emergence of liberated cities, those liberated cities uh, were liberated from their own people uh, with the entry of the Air Force uh, bombing. After the Aleppo uh, battle, uh, more uh, Air Force was used, and the regime was the biggest reason behind pushing people to become refugees. There were two uh, cities uh, which were occupied, and according to the testimony of people, who after the establishment of uh, a Zaatari uh, refugee camp, were from poor people, for example, who were in need of help from others. L Lebanon was different in a way, and also the middle class uh, uh, who uh, um, immigrated to Lebanon in 2013, around that. Uh, Egypt also during the short reign of uh, Morsi uh, attracted uh, Syrians, people with some capital or uh, professional people, uh, who thought that the revolution might impact their businesses, uh, moved to Egypt, and there is a lot of commonalities in the culture. And until 2013, the number of refugees was by and large less than one million. The main factor in causing was between 2013 2014 uh, which caused uh, many Syrians to start thinking of uh, going abroad as refugees with the entering of Iraqi militias and Hezbollah as uh, and the f uh, according to Hezbollah's narrative, in order to uh, to save 100 Shia people in three villages, they ended up controlling four or five or six entire towns of Sunni Muslims. And also after the usage of uh, chemical weapons and the deal reached between Obama and the Russians, it was difficult for people to see that uh, uh, the, the, the regime was given a carte blanche to do what it likes. 
and also they said about the jihadis uh, uh, coming to Syria and uh, all of this uh, is true but we must say that the jihadis and uh, Islamists led to the increase in the number of uh, displaced persons within Syria and uh, most of it was because they really went too far in imposing uh, on people how they should dress or how they should behave. But it was the mil Shiite militias through their massacres uh, and um, mutilation acts of people uh, pushed people, even some people who are pro the Bashar Assad regime started thinking of leaving their countries. Uh, this, uh, we all remember that uh, Syrians were reminded uh, that they should have a, a return ticket before going anywhere in Europe. This time round, the migration <coughs> to Europe as refugees was a one-way ticket trip. Europe first uh, received about 1.1 million refugees. Syrians uh, constituted some 48 percent of them, and there was around 28,000 refugee applications made by Syrians every month. Even uh, this was until uh, March of 2016. Uh, Germany was the prime destination for Syrians. Although the Syrians are present uh, in other countries and they were by and large were poor Syrians. Uh, and it was said that to go to Europe uh, as uh, refugees, illegal refugees, would cost something between five to six thousand euros. And this, of course, is not something poor people could afford. So it wasn't every single Syrian was able to make it to Germany, relying on their uh, own financial resources. And also, there were other factors like uh, some Christians and some Druze and some Alawites uh, were at attracted to uh, special consideration cases in uh, applying for their uh, refugee status. And also the failure of the Geneva Peace Conference in 2014, which led to the conclusion that there was no hope of uh, any political settlement and the involvement of the Iraqi Shiite militias and the involvement of the Sunni jihadist groups and also the Russian veto at the Security Council and not allowing for any form of condemnation of the regime as a result of its behavior and also for example, uh, the Germany uh, had uh, lesser stringent conditions for refugees uh, and uh, even some people went as on temporary as temporary refugees and they had uh, th whatever savings they had would run out and Martin Dempsey's uh, uh, testimony said that this war between Shiites and Sunnis may take 10 years and should not end before uh, a solution which takes into account America and Israel's own interests, etc. And, and this led to something like 6.7 million uh, refugees and the biggest uh, a disaster since World War II. The second part of this paper is uh, not related to displacement maybe, but the demographic changes. Has there been a demographic changes? Yes, and the figures are there to speak for themselves. Uh, 
and also Bashar al-Assad is not, he said Syria is not for all Syrians, but Syria is for the Syrians who fight for it. So therefore allowing uh, non-Syrians to become Syrians because they fought for his regime and uh, Syrians themselves were made to leave the country. Can the demographic change be described as uh, sectarian? I read through some 20 agreements on different, pertaining to different cities. You see the figures uh, in areas like Daraya, the Jebel Sheikh, Aleppo, Eastern Goto, Kunaitara, uh, uh, according to all the observations and testimonies, we will see from the figures that the uh, the regime never insisted on the civilians leaving. Sometimes they insisted on their remaining. And he was trying also, also insisting on the armed groups to remain also in the hope of reintegrating them into their own so-called uh, popular uh, commissions. So, also, even the ISIS fighters were including <coughs> that. The main focus was uh, on the youth, and uh, the Russians also gave, like, asked for a grace period of six months to one year for the young to rejoin the army. And also after uh, reconciliation agreements and through the testimonies heard, there is no indication that the regime worked on any demographic change, purposeful demographic change. But in some areas like Daraya uh, represented a model in the uh, that they had a local council and they had uh, a military faction which did not allow any other jihadi groups to enter the area and and also uh, they proved that uh, the myth of the Republican Guards as a fighting force uh, was totally destroyed because they defeated them in battle and there was an attempt therefore to push the population either the direction of, of uh, uh, Idlib or the, and this uh, the force the, the, the regime forces could not enter the area until the Iranians interfered militarily the agreement of the four cities, this was uh, a demographic change based on sectarian affiliations, which is really quite clear. The four cities uh, from uh, Kfariya and Fa'a, because they are Shiite towns and they represent Hezbollah in the rural areas of Idlib, this was in return for uh, liberating the fighting force of Ahrar al-Sham in Zabadani. But the surprising thing is how many outside forces interfered. Syria, uh, sorry, R Russia, Lebanon, Qatar, Iran, and uh, the United Nations. The only parties which did not sign the agreement were the Syrian regime and the Syrian opposition. So this is I'm trying. This is what I'm trying to prove here that uh, when we we saw how how the the demographic changes in Syria were led not by the regime but by outside forces, specifically Iran, with sponsorship of Russia and others. So there is an Iranian 
attempt to find a new demographic engineering of Syria. It does not stop at buying property in Dummar projects and others, which is the most vivid example. But uh, uh, around 21 location of like holy shrines or graves were uh, invented to declare them as religious sites to be later on uh, points of attraction for Shia's population. So therefore, the demographic change was not a reflection of the internal forces, but the outside forces. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. Please, if you maybe have some 10 minutes for some uh, questions and answers. We start with the left this time. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Arab Center. Thank you to all speakers. My name is Nizar Lahraki. I'm the Syrian ambassador. Can you give me some time, please? Because I am a witness from the 18th of March, 2011. Uh, I say to Dr. Raja, don't you think that uh, the closed social uh, situation condition in the society for Syria, don't you think as was uh, a stumbling block to develop Sy Syrian society, but at the same time, other organizations with other uh, directions, when they interfered, they caused uh, they caused uh, uh, huge rifts in society, especially in the midst of women and children, to the extent that we find that uh, large percentages in divorce rates. My question to Mr. Samer, to call the revolution a revolution is just by way of generalization is not fair. We know the beginnings was different. In the first uh, six months or so, the people on the street uh, used to call each Friday a name which represents the entire Syrian society. It was the regime and its supporting powers outside uh, pushed towards militarizing and uh, when they realized that uh, the revolution was uh, by Arab and Sunni people, and this <laughs> led to the Iranian involvement, which has a project which is totally contrary to the revolution's project. You were saying that in your presentation, uh, when it comes to return, I asked you to say this not to the Syrian people, but to the Russians. Uh, the, 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 the Russians, they are uh, bombarding civilians and not the Igors or... Uh, and. Uh, the last time they bombed a camp was the Qah camp, and uh, they all are doing what they're doing in northern Syria. The situation we got to now is double standards, in fact. Since 1948, the fall of Palestine, the international community is dealing with us on this basis. The last. Uh, comment is to Mr. Hamza, uh, liberating uh, different governments, and since the liberation of Qunaytara, 
the the government has been working to empty the the liberated areas of their own uh, uh, inhabitants and in east dara 250 houses were destroyed although their owners remained they didn't go to northern syria but their houses were destroyed because they showed some sympathy to the revolution and also there are people who are placed under house arrest and some have not uh, left their areas at all and the collective punishment exercised by the regime and the regime also said that the land belongs to those who protect it and the regime specifically said it, they do not need all Syrians. And 2011, when the revolution was still in Dara, some people from went from Dara went to Sweda, and the people said this attacked their cars, and they said, "You've come to destroy the country." Of course, there were other people who like Osama Zahreddin, who was a first lieutenant from Sweda, who lost his life fighting with the revolution. And we have to say, and we must mention and give credit where credit is due. Two questions. You said some Christian properties which were subjected to looting. What about uh, property belonging to other sects? And also <coughs> the last speaker said the regime was not attempting to expel people, but after what we saw after the reconciliation agreements, did the regime have a policy of encouraging people to stay or not? I thank you all. I have two questions to Dr. Raja. You said in your conclusions that <coughs> the war in Syria is not sectarian. But uh, I ask you, what about sectarian uh, practices in Salamiya and Suwaida? My second question to Dr. Samer, what about the external dimension and the ideologies of the Islamist movements in Idlib? Thank you very much, Ismi Zahra. Thank you. I have a question to Dr. Tada. You said in your study, <coughs> in the phase of the mass uh, migration and after the appearance of the uh, terrorists and uh, extremists, the number of displaced people were less. So, is this phenomena related? We don't have much time. One thirty, we stop. Fadl Abdel Ghani, a human rights activist in Syria. The issue of forced uh, displacement in uh, Syria is very complicated, but there are uh, radical uh, elements. So what made these people become displaced? More legislators uh, speak about uh, displa internal displacement as part of this forced migration. They left, they fled the areas that were bombarded by the regime. 75% of those bombardments happened by uh, air force uh, strikes. 
So we have to distinguish. There are radical causes and there are uh, uh, perpetrators. The regime has uh, caused them to become displaced because or due to the bombardment, the sexual attacks, uh, uh, detentions, etc. Then you have uh, migration caused uh, due to, to ethnic or religious uh, reasons. So there are a lot of perpetrators. There's also accumulated displacement, like displacement within the displacement, like it happened in Idlib, and then uh, there were counterattacks which caused another displacement. The uh, a question is what prevents them from returning? This is necessary. <coughs> so these are uh, ways of legislating or making legitimate, legitimizing the crime itself and, and uh, preventing them from returning. So if they return, uh, they may be also forced to uh, be displaced again. We cannot hear the speaker. Please use the microphone. Thank you, Mohammed Al Masri from the Arab Center. I have a first observation. The first two months of the Syrian revolution, there was a clear strategy by the uh, Syrian regime speaking about uh, terrorists and sectarian groups targeting the state of Syria. So from the very first moment of the revolution, this was the strategy the regime adopted. My question to Mr. Hamza. You say that the Syrian regime strategy didn't take into consideration the forced displacement of civilians in areas where reconciliation happened. In other words, maybe they don't want a demographic change. This strategy is in contradiction with that of other parties. And why this strategy not to cause the displacement of civilians there? How does this uh, go in harmony with its fascist or Nazi uh, strategy, uh, considering that uh, the Syrian community is now more harmonized? You spoke about 21 Shia shrines or locations that were invaded. Are they present for, uh, or has this happened for the, to cause a demographic change in Syria? Or is this to motivate the combatants that came from Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Lebanon? So is this temporary only during times of war and it will end in order to preserve their uh, cohesion? Or did it cause demographic uh, displacement? And if there, uh, there are figures about the demographic change for specific uh, religious groups? Sorry, we can no longer take any further questions due to time constraints. We will still have a lot of sessions on the Syrian situation, and we can raise all these issues, and we can elaborate on that later on. So we can speak about that later. Now I will give the floor uh, uh, by order to the colleagues to answer the questions. Maybe I was misunderstood. Uh, Was there a demographic change? Yes, Bashar al-Assad said that we are more cohesive. But a demographic change happened f uh, uh, from a political perspective. The regime insisted on whomever gives that uh, loyalty, even if it's fake loyalty. I spoke about the sectarian demographic change, Alawis and Sunnas, Sunnis. Because at a certain point, as it's happening right now in Damascus, the regime feels uh, uh, exposed due to the uh, Iraqi militia, so it uh, seeks the support of the Sunni militias to preserve itself, because if the regime falls in Damascus, uh, Iraqi militias control Damascus now. Iraq may return after the crisis uh, there, but that's what I said. 
if the combatants of ISIS had accepted to be part of the security committees, the regime attracted them and gave them salaries, and they are preserving the security in Qadam and other regions. Now, for the sectarian change uh, uh, approach, this happened through Hezbollah, uh, which focused on Qalamun. The town that Hezbollah uh, dealt with in a harsh way with Zabadani because it, it has a headquarters for Hezbollah and was being bombarded before the revolution by Israel. <coughs> it dealt with it uh, very violently. Its approach was to change all the demographic structure to bring more combatants from a different uh, category. This is why uh, Hezbollah and Iran insisted on the uh, convention of the four cities. Also, the regime and the opposition both refused that, and the sectarian demographic change happened under the sponsorship of the United Nations. Now, for the shrines, they started for this reason, in order to support the resistance. There is a, a burial uh, location in Damascus, and then we find Shias are spreading in those areas, and then they establish hotels. If you know Damascus, you know that the hotels of Shia, uh, for the Shia visitors, how uh, uh, did they expand and how part of them became Shia? The people from Damascus, the Damascene, were uh, uh, partly Shia, but they never uh, uh, showed it clearly, but now you see them clearly showing their Shia. This is the real fear. Also in Aleppo, and, uh, there's the rock of the Hussein head and the shrine of Zayn al-Abidin bin Ali. The picture is just a stone, it's just a rock. And they mentioned that here was uh, where uh, the son of Hussein, uh, where his blood was spilled. The Iranian presence in Syria goes beyond the military dimension. We have to recognize that this is causing a lot of problems. Resisting the spread of uh, Shia is through the Alawis. The regime admits 100,000 uh, people killed, most of which are from Alawi regions, asking their widows to become Shia through the Iranian uh, Shia associations is the plan. Why uh, the regime has no policy for sectarian uh, change? Because at the end of the day, demographics uh, dictate uh, things. You cannot expel 70% of the population if they are Sunnis. But now with the Shia uh, dissemination is uh, happening, and this is why resistance against it is showing, especially as, uh, amongst Alawis. Daraya used to be an example that continued to attack the fourth group, the IRG, and they were unable to uh, enter the area. And the regime insisted that it doesn't want the city. The first, For the first time since 1400, the 1400s, Daraya has no population. I will answer in order. For the concept of the revolution, I don't want my family and friends uh, to hear me say revolution. I was uh, studying in 2011 with the support of the government, uh, but then in 2012 and 13, they stopped supporting me because I gave a uh, lecture on the Syrian revolution. So I'm not going to change my position. I only mentioned Syrian revolution in my paper that I sent to the Arab Center, but I didn't mention that in the presentation. That's first. Second, the regime allowed the opening of the pockets. 
In 2016, the regime was on the verge of breaking down, especially in the eastern part of Aleppo. But it always leaned towards sectarianism, as mentioned by uh, my colleague Hamza. It convinced the Sunnis that it protects the moderate Sunni religious regime. And then it went back to the Shia and Druze to convince them of the same. The regime wanted something specific, which is to destroy and then to reform for any minorities, including the, Shi the Shia or the Druze. Now, about the Russians. displacement that was uh, caused by the regime's oppression and destruction has led to displacement. My research focused on a new topic, which is, for example, the displacement of the minorities, the role of regional international forces in this displacement, and the use of ideology that I will answer in the second question. So the regime is the first. and. It's first and foremost responsible for the displacement. To go back to uh, the gentleman's question, the other properties of the other uh, uh, religious groups, uh, were they uh, victim as well? Yes. I, uh, the paper spoke about the Sufis. The properties of uh, many Sufis were looted in the area. Uh, there were people that were brought down from the minarets. They were uh, prevented from practicing their religion. Some of their property was confiscated. We're talking about the sheikh's clergyman here, religious figures, whose property was confiscated. The Sufis uh, were accused of not having any revolution uh, tendencies. When I spoke about the properties of the Druze, the Igor, settled in, a, uh, in Jabal Sumak, which is very close to where Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was killed, 10 minutes away. So they settled in the abandoned uh, houses of the displaced. Now, for the external dimension and how it affects the ideology, this is very relevant. I know I discussed that uh, in my paper, and I said that the ideological objectives of the regional countries were restructured, and they became a winning card for the regional countries. And uh, they are linked to the political tools adopted by these countries, such as the Four City Agreement. <coughs> that was a tool or means for the Russians, the Turks, and the so this was used in the regional uh, agreements. And a last point on the bombarding. When we speak about those bombings, they are a cause and not a, uh, a consequence. So they cause displacement after the oppression of the regime. What prevents them from returning is the rule of law, the return of property. When there's no rule of law, how can I go to a court or a tribunal to uh, obtain my rights? When there's a rule of law, then security would uh, prevail. And the returning the property that was previously confiscated would happen for those displaced. Thank you. <coughs> for the first question, uh, what raised this question may be the allocation of help to women. Yes, uh, I agree with you. It has caused a stir between. Uh, amongst women and children. I always insist that uh, any aid should be given to men and women together, and women cannot be enabled unless this is done so. But there is more than one aspect to this. I agree with you. In this, uh, some organizations, many of them suddenly appeared with some uh, mystery surrounding their history, 
Some uh, appeared very quickly with their uh, employees not being fully qualified and the role they played caused a rift, but at the same time you cannot ignore the role of other organizations. <coughs> also, you mentioned divorce rates. We go back to the same reason because uh, men were not supported as strongly as women have by these organizations. This may have uh, led to a rift, maybe there was corruption, and also the fact that uh, some women managed to earn an income, and this uh, made women feel secure enough to leave the marriage they were in. Of course, there are divorce rates which are cause for concern. Maybe some women were thinking of divorce but would not dare uh, announce it publicly before being more secure. You mentioned uh, the incidents in Salamiya and other Suwaida. I insist that in any field study or survey I do, I must be there when when I was in Sweda, I could not enter some villages because I'm from Dara, because they told me for your own personal safety, you are advised not to enter these villages because you are from Dara. I was told by the checkpoints outside the village and also places controlled by Al-Qaeda at that time. In some of the areas under siege, I was threatened. I remember uh, there, there was a person who was responding to my questionnaire. Once he finished with me, he said, you shouldn't be allowed to leave this area alive. This may have been an isolated incident, but you know, the, I said in the beginning that uh, I've been working as a social researcher for more than 10 years. I gave some general uh, general uh, in a description. There may have been exceptions, of course. As for the lady who asked about the impact of terrorists and extremists, they were present in almost every phase of the displacements, but this particular phase, maybe it was linked to uh, the presence of terrorists, and this <coughs> is why I mentioned them. When they enter an area with, this, uh, um, with no populations remaining, sometimes people come and enter these areas and impose their control. I thank the speakers and I thank you. And the Syrian question will undoubtedly take uh, a lot of our time. And there is a lot to be said because of the magnitude of the disaster. Thank you.